Thank you, Sonny. That was beautiful. So, once again, it's the month of December. Our theme is Holy Days. It's the third week, and we have the celebration of Yalda going on. So, uh, there's a festival in Iran, and on that day, they would eat watermelon, fruits and nuts, and dried fruit. And what they're celebrating is, is the birth of Mithra. It's the god of the sun that has the qualities of light, goodness, and joy. Because back in the day, it was always set in the time of the winter solstice, when the darkness was longest and darkest. And back in the day, a lot of people were afraid that the sun would not return. And this was a celebration that would assure them that it would happen. And it's interesting because um, this religion that honored Mithra was really the god of the uh, Roman soldiers. So one school of scholars, one or two, some people may argue with me, um, they set the birth of Jesus Christ from January through March back to this time of the winter solstice so they could incorporate some of the Romans into the uh, Christian movement. And so it's, it's really meaningful for us to that. And before this time, if we go back another few hundred years, um, the Zoroastrian tradition, they celebrated the winter solstice. And this, and the darkest days was when the evil Lord Ahriman was at his peak. And the good Lord, the Ahura Mazda, defeated Ahriman at this time. And it's important because this was three or four hundred before the Common Era. So this was the time, especially in the mainstream Christianity and Jewish religions, where we had the definition of this evil person doing battle with a good person. So thank you Zoroastrianism for giving us 2,000 years of drama. <laughs> and they made the association that evil was associated with dark at this time. But how many of you love these long nights, love when you get out from work, get in your car at 530, it's dark, we have, we, have, we, have, we have one person in the audience. <laughs> you go out to sit on the porch, and um, it's freezing outside. You can't see the sunset because the sun went down two hours ago. <laughs> so, um, and, and, we're, we're, and we're all different, and some people are more attuned to it. Um, Chris George mentioned to me after the first service that... Um, some of us, biologically, we need the light too. So we're all these beings that like the light. But what we are searching for is we're searching for what I'm going to use an analogy here. We're searching for that eternal flame. And so we associate the light. Ernest Holmes certainly does it. Thank you for that great reading too, Rachel. Um, Ernest Holmes associates the light with the essence of divine inside of us. And for me, this month of having the holy days, of celebrating all the different traditions, let, lets us as a movement step into our greatness. Because as a movement and as a teaching, we believe in the evolution of consciousness. We believe that there's a golden thread that's woven not only through the religious and spiritual traditions. It's woven through science, it's woven through psychology, and it's woven through sociology. So if we believe that sign that's on the wall that says we're radically inclusive, not only does that mean that we welcome anyone that walks through that back door, we welcome guidance from all these threads of truth because if we were exclusive, we would be missing out on pieces of the truth. So we have this eternal flame, 
And this has been a really good month because we've seen it exhibited in our weeks that we've talked about. The first week, Nicole talked about the Jewish tradition of the menorah. And when we talk about evolving our consciousness, um, we look for enlightenment. And I looked up the definition of enlightenment that I really liked was the experience of spiritual wisdom. I didn't say the study. I didn't say the knowledge. I said the experience. And sometimes we can experience that in a very, very active way. And sometimes we can experience that in a very silent way. Lots of solitude. Lots of peace. And so the first week, Nicole told you about the Jewish people having the faith to light the first candle of the menor uh, menorah with just enough olive oil. They knew it would take eight days to press more olive oil. But they stepped out on their faith, on the God of their choosing, and in the Jewish tradition of the God of their covenant, and said, we will step out, we will take action. And lo and behold, the candle stayed lit for eight days until they had more olive oil. On the second week, on Bodhi Day, it was a different thing. We had the same resolve. And a Hindu mystic and yogi named Siddhartha made up his mind with the same resolution that he would go sit under that fig tree by the river and obtain the answers he'd been frustrated and hadn't get. Primarily, why do we suffer? And he would sit there until his flesh rotted off his bones or until he got the answer. So with that resolve, the Buddha did it in a much different way. So we're all after this eternal flame. And darkness, remember in ancient times, they were really afraid of this because the agricultural cycle, if they had too much darkness, they didn't have food and they didn't survive. But darkness bothers us. And when we look at, when we talk about what's inside of us that we call dark, or we call the shadow side. I know that when I stuff things down for a long period of time, and when I illuminate them, they look pretty scary to me. They look, don't they, don't they look grotesque to us? But I want to stand here and tell you that it's not Aramon, it's not Satan, it's not the devil down there making this thing disfigured and looking terrible. What it is, it's been starved of light and goodness. And so the Buddha told us there's not enough darkness in the world to extinguish the light of a single, single candle. And we have in our philosophy a great belief that we can fix everything by changing our mind. Ernest Holmes, and my favorite Hindu mystic, Sri Aurobindo, tells us that consciousness is the ground of all being. And I want to use one of my favorite metaphors from Ernest Holmes that I've changed a little bit for myself. Because our mind can create our life. So what I want to tell you is this metaphor where he's looking out at a dark ocean. And now your mind can turn that spiritual stuff of the dark ocean into this beautiful crystal sculpture. Or, depending on where your mind is going, it could turn it into this grotesque sculpture that's bothering you. And they are eye sculptures. And they will stay eye sculptures as long as your consciousness supports them, as long as you have need for them. But there comes a time when they're no longer of service to you. You stop supporting them in consciousness. They melt back to the spiritual stuff from whence they came. And so all that's out there, the good, the bad, and the indifferent, 
is in that vast ocean of spiritual stuff. And it's up for us to decide where it came from. And I want to um, share another aspect with you that darkness has no power of its own. And it's a scientific and engineering aspect. And um, per permit me to go back to my college days, do a bit of a humble brag, yet at the same time bring up a bit of this grotesqueness I've been talking about. It's actually the same experience for me. So somehow I got this bug in me and I decided that I had wanted to be a chemical engineer, not knowing how tough the curriculum was. So I told my parents I wanted to go to MIT. They said, no, Michael, we've saved some money, and if you work when going to school, you could go to a Texas school. So that saved me from a really bad decision, but I made the next bad decision. I said, I want to go to Texas A&M. And back in that day, Texas A&M was sixth in the nation in chemical engineering. And I won't lie to you, it was brutal. We had 1,000 people in our department, and we graduated 50 people. <laughs> and so on the first major test, um, in the hardest class that flunks everyone out, it's thermodynamics, um, you're taking the test, and, nor and the normal thing is the girls are literally crying. <laughs> and so I got my grade back from that test, and the score was 17 out of 100. And um, then the teacher put the range of grades on the board, and I had the highest grade in the class. <laughs> so I told you the decision was challenging, didn't I? And so I want to share with you a little bit of thermodynamics. Believe me, I'm going to step it down. If I couldn't answer those questions now, I, I couldn't even still answer them today. But I want to step it down and, and show you three principles that talk about dark and light and the same thing. The one principle is about cold and heat. Actually, cold has no power into of itself. And you can only get so cold. There is something called absolute zero that exists. And when we personalize this, Think about your cold and you're adjusting a rheostat to warm yourself up. And if there's any millennials in the audience, a rheostat is a knob we used to turn instead of punching <laughs> buttons. <laughs> and um, so there's a thermodynamic principle that when you, when you have a body of heat and expose it to a body of cold, the cold no longer maintains its coldness. It has to take the principle of heat and warm up. The second thermodynamic principle is concentrations of salts in water. So if you have this pristine, clear water, and you have this salty water, and if you mix them instantaneously, the clean water is no longer clean. It can't fight back. And then the third principle I want to get back to is the darkness and the light. So the darkness has no concept of darkness that it can maintain. It's not a property that it can maintain. So the moment there's some light radiating the darkness, the darkness no longer becomes darkness. So, um, Thank you, Zoroastrianism, for giving us this 25-year, 2,500-year battle. But I want to relate it to one more spiritual principle that we talk about here from time to time, and that's the principle of grace. So grace is the givingness of God no matter what we've done. Grace is that eternal flame that's always within us. And so for a reality check here, you guys be honest, and I'll raise my hand on this one. How many of you have ever felt that you don't deserve the full grace of God because something you've done in the past? I know I, we're, we're never perfect people. 
Nicole tells me all the time I don't look everyone in the eye all the time, right? So we all have our flaws. But be careful, because that's your right. That's your right that you were born with. That is actually your nature. And it's a slippery slope, because you look at another person, think about the person you despise the most. And you say to that other person, or you don't say it, you, maybe you don't say it to them, you say it to someone <laughs> out third party, right? <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't say it to their face, it'd be too nasty. That they don't deserve the grace of God because for what they've done. So you've got the rear stat, right? And then you've just turned the rear stat down. And what have you turned down about the grace and the warmth that you'll have in your life? You've turned it down for yourself. So this grace of God is the givingness of God, this givingness of the eternal light. And it is ours to have whenever we choose to have it. So I have three suggestions to you. They all involve grace. And the first suggestion is that this next week, you become the grace of God. You go out and help someone. If you have money, help them with money. If you can be of service, be of service to them. If you can show them love and compassion, show them love and compassion. And the second suggestion I have is you go pray for someone. And I want you to pray the way we pray here, to do the affirmative prayer because we teach our students, our practitioners, and our ministers that when we pray, we see the perfection, this eternal light inside come blossoming forth. We don't pray for the sick person. We pray for that life of perfection to make its way forth and to be the life of that person. And the third thing I'll suggest is that you pray for yourself. Well, if you're this radiant light or this gift of warmth, of heat, to really impact everyone you meet, you want to get the chinks out of your armor. You want to do your spiritual work, your spiritual practice. Because the warmer you are, the more radiant you are, the more you take care of your own business, the more benefit and the more power you can become to others. So I think if you will address these things and do them, the darkness may not quite bother you quite as much as it has. Thank you.